Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and chips and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, and partners, I should say, and Andrea await you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. That didn't sound right, did it? No. <laughs> you got a bit messed up, but I think everyone got the idea. I'm not a polygamist. <laughs> Tell us about your chat room, Ravinder. The chat room is the greatest chat room ever. We have a great group of people. Um, they all contribute to the conversation. I learn as much from the chat room as I can sometimes on the air. Plus the fact we have a good laugh in there too. So it's just lots of fun. So if you can join us, if you are somewhere safe, you know, you're not driving or anything like that, or your boss isn't breathing down your neck, then do go to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. You can come in, just say hello, or just watch, you know, the conversation unwinding there. Unwinding. Unwinding. That's not quite the right word, is it? Scrolling through. So, yeah, yeah, kind of. And, of course, if you can't join us live, you can always go back to the chat room. By that, I mean if you can't join the chat room live, you can always go back to the chat room, look at the archive, and review everything that was discussed, including you post webs, uh, yeah, URLs, and you also usually have a video. You have a video today. Is that correct? Yes, we do indeed. All right. Now, before we go to this week's spotlight, I want to take a moment to recognize a giant in the field of self-help, Louise Hay. She founded Hay House Publishing after writing Heal Your Body in 1976. She was a true pioneer, and at the age of 90, she crossed over yesterday of natural causes while in her sleep. Two years to the day after the passing of her dearest friend, Rest in peace, Louise, and thanks for all that you did to improve the human condition. Would you like to add something to that, Ravinder? She was a wonderful lady, impacted loads of lives around the world. So you rest in peace. That is one successful life. You know, that's kind of where I come from. She is a true success, you know. She gave and gave and gave. Continues to give. Uh, her estate, I understand, is going to her foundation, which supports a number of causes around the world, feeding, you know, the poor and the needy. Uh, for that matter, supporting our favorite cause, Women for Women. Yeah. All right. Now, in this week's spotlight, I wish to discuss giving. There are many forms of giving, and they all lead to some interesting findings. For example. Did you know that you're hardwired in such a way that the brain's reward centers light up? To use the words of neuroscientists, when you do something as simple as write a check to a cause that you believe in. Think of that for a moment. The act of giving actually rewards you with a stress-busting feel-good chemical known as endorphins. Did you also know that the act of giving has been shown in research to add to many health benefits such as lowering blood pressure, ameliorating depression, increasing self-esteem, lowering stress levels, and adding greater happiness and long life. According to a study published in the International Journal of Psychophysiology, people who gave social support to others had lower blood pressure than people who didn't. Supportive interaction with others also help people recover from coronary-related events. I've used this technique with clients and found remarkable results. The fact is, when you help another, it defines you in a special way. It adds purpose to your life. When you know that your life matters to someone else, that you have gone to the aid of another in need, there is a silent reward that informs you of just how important one person can be. To another. One small act by one person can make a real difference, and as I write this, the news is reporting record rainfall and flooding in Texas. 
The damage is devastating, and the event will take years to recover. So many people in need. It seems only human that we should all find a way to help. Perhaps by praying, giving a dollar or two according to what you can, or simply writing letters to the victims offering hope. There are so many organizations that will happily help you in your efforts to contribute something meaningful to those in need. A simple click of your mouse will reveal the right one for you. I want to encourage each and every one of you to remember that whatever our differences, we are still one people. One people made up of one person at a time, one kind act at a time, one gesture of love and caring at a time. And this, I'm sure, you will find to be both personally healing and gratefully received. Remember, as Bill Wilson puts it, to the world, you may be one person. But to one person, you may be the world. Your thoughts on this, Ravinder? Oh, I definitely agree with the benefits of helping other people and to give. And what, one of the things I would remind everyone out there is when you accept a gift graciously, you are the person who gives you the gift is benefiting as well. So you actually give them a gift in return in your acceptance because then they get all those good hormones that flow through their system too. And it does um, help. I mean, this stuff that's going on down in Texas right now is really distressing. So it can simply help to do something. But I would also remind everyone, don't forget all the other good causes out there as well. Um, so yeah, it's big. It's a big picture. I know it gets all very complicated. But if you do something, you will feel better for it. Well, okay. My mind right this minute, of course, on those people in Texas and Louisiana that are dealing with uh, a major crisis and uh, I would hope that every day we are paying attention to other causes. This cause, however, seems to immediately trump. Uh, but those are just my thoughts. Uh, okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last live show featured our guest, Professor Kevin Leyland, and we spoke about how culture has created the mind. Mike wrote, the idea that culture shapes our intellect seems so obvious. Why hasn't it been taught before? CB commented, that was a fast hour. I could listen to Dr. Leyland for a few more. Richard wrote, wow, that's one I'm going to have to replay. Of course, my fingers will go fast to Barnes & Noble. Your fingers always run to the bookstore, Richard. Moving on, Marshall wrote, I must tell you, I love your show. It is always fresh and so informative. If thinking can be provocative... You have branded it properly. I like that one, huh? Absolutely. Catherine wrote, thank you so much for your wonderful products. They seem to be making a huge difference in the way I conduct my daily living. I have purchased several of your Intertalk collections and single CDs. Finally, Andrew wrote, it has only been five days that I have been listening to my weight loss and using metabolism to melt fat programs. Already I'm noticing a very marked difference in appetite. I'm not as hungry as I used to be, and I get full faster. And I've been more active in the past five days than I have been in the past two months. I've been playing pickup games of basketball and did a sprint workout today. I'm a believer in inner talk now. Well, we're glad about that, Andrew. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But we love your feedback, so please keep it coming. You can opine by writing me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. That's D-R-E-L-D-O-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. We do sincerely appreciate your thoughts and ideas. Now to today's show. Master your self-talk, master your life with our guest and co-host, Ravinder Taylor. Every week you hear her, some on the show, but usually she spends most of her time in our chat room. Today, Andrea is hosting the chat room, and Ravinder will be our guest. Many of you have asked for more information about InterTalk, and Ravinder has graciously volunteered to answer the same sort of questions she is asked every day when doing customer service. So let me tell you a little about her first. Ravinder Taylor is Vice President of Progressive Awareness Research, Incorporated, PAR, 
She has been employed with the company for 25 years, beginning in the shipping department and working her way up the company. As such, she is very well acquainted with every aspect of the company's operation. She currently directly oversees the marketing and PR operations, contributing editorial content, web design, copy editing, and research proposals. She left the UK's Department of Trade and Industry, DTI, to join Progressive Awareness. Before the DTI, she was employed in a path lab. Ravinder holds a BA, Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology from Aberystwyth University in Wales. A Bachelor's degree in Metaphysics from the University of Metaphysics in Sedona, Arizona, and is, or, and is an ordained interdenominational minister. In her time at PAR, she has acted as a senior editor of five international best-selling books and single-handedly launched the marketing campaign that made Choices and Illusions a New York Times bestseller. She is trained publicist and has herself represented clients as their publishing agent, including myself. Thank you very much, Ravinder. She is also co-author of the Peripheral Learning Desk Reference, a volume dedicated to reviewing literally thousands of research designs, examining subliminal research. So on that, let's get her in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Ravinder. Well, thanks for having me. Now, as usual, I'm going to start you like I start everyone. Okay. You know, I want you to tell us about yourself. What is your background? How did you come to be an executive of Progressive Awareness Research? Well, you know, mine's kind of an interesting... I think I kind of fell into this. I was born in India, and but my family moved to England before I was two. Um, you know, I think the gods were guiding me along the way. So in the fact that I was brought up in England gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have had um, in India. I think I was always interested in the power of the mind. I, I, always, I was always aware that there was something more. So while, you know, academically I was doing the biology because as any good Indian girl, she's going to try to be a doctor, you know, doctor, lawyer, that's what your parents always want you to do. And so I did the biology, but I, I wasn't good enough to go into medicine. So I went on to microbiology um, and I realized, you know, that that wasn't captivating me at all but I did get more and more interested in the mind and uh, started reading more and more books and then I was I did a course in hypnosis and psychotherapy in England and that was where I met you and you brought me over here and my life has never been the same since but this whole idea um, yeah I mean I believe in I De destiny, I suppose. I think I was supposed to be here and that's what made the transition so easy for me when you think I came from a very, very traditional Indian background, arranged marriages are the norm, um, all of those cultural issues that went on. But no, I landed on my feet, didn't I? Oh, I believe you did. Any cultural impasses because of the decisions you made? Oh, absolutely. You know, my family totally disapproved of everything that I do. I, there are members of my family that don't talk to me to this day, or if they do, it's very cursory. They just aren't able to see beyond um, the bare basics. You know, I broke the rules, so any successes I have don't mean anything. They just don't mean anything at all. But that's their loss you know I have learned and I keep on learning in life itself so I enjoy that part I am growing and that's been the the best part of you know being married to you and working with you and looking at all of this stuff together we do walk the talk we are constantly trying to find out what the real tr the truths are out there we we, we we, we don't just fall for the easy answers. The, com the convenient answers don't do it for us. We just carry on hammering it out. And, you know, sometimes you and I can battle some of these ideas out, but I think they, it keeps us honest and on the path, and I'm blessed. Well, I think, you know, I'm blessed too, so I, I have to add that in there. But let's see if we can't keep this uh, more professional. What yes, exactly sir. is self-sabotage? <laughs> Why would anyone, I mean, think about it. Why would anyone sabotage themselves? 
You know, that's one of the most common questions we can get on the phone when I'm talking to customers. You know, people are always going to say, but I want to lose weight. I'm determined to lose weight. I have to do that because my daughter's getting married and I have to fit into the dress or, you know, all of these things. I mean, people have their definite goals and desires, um, but then, you know, they will ask me, well, why would I sabotage myself? Well, quite simply this, self-sabotage is frequently your way of protecting yourself. Your subconscious mind has taken in all the information over your entire lifetime um, and it takes that stuff in. So if, for example, so, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, but if somewhere in your past there was this idea that, um, if I put on extra weight, then I won't be as attractive and I won't get the unwanted attention from the guys at school. Or um, I'm under a great deal of stress and mom always eats extra when she's under stress. So therefore, perhaps I should eat more when I'm under stress. You know, there are these conflicting ideas. So as an adult, you say, OK, I want to lose weight. But you have all of these other things going on. And so your subconscious mind frequently simply wants to protect you. It doesn't want you to get hurt again. And you can work through all of the different examples, you know. So um, if you don't get that promotion at work and you're repeatedly passed over for the promotion at work, well, perhaps there is, you know, a subconscious strategy there that says, um, if I don't get the promotion, then I won't have to do public speaking. And I absolutely hate public speaking because way back, you know, I made a total fool of myself in school. I did a speech and everyone laughed, you know. All of these ideas and memories remain there and they they can trip you up. So if you come across any issue where you are repeating the same thing over and over again, if you always fall for the wrong person, if you always fail a particular exam that you are fully capable of passing, if you constantly see that kind of stuff going on, if you constantly fail to achieve your goal, even though there isn't any real reason for it, then I would say look towards self-sabotage. There is some self-destructive pattern going on. Can there be self-destructive patterns that we don't see outwardly, such as you suggest, like the weight loss issue? Can there be other issues that are in the subconscious that just block us from um, doing things? I mean, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, assume I have the belief that I just don't deserve or I'm not good enough or, you know, I'm, I'm socially awkward, uh, you know. Do those things also work to undermine, you know, our desires, our goals, our ambitions? Absolutely. If you don't believe that you're capable of achieving something, then quite frankly, you're not going to try your best to achieve it because you have to prove to yourself that you were right all along, that you're not worthy of anything. Look, see, I failed again. In fact, we had someone on the radio show not too long ago, wasn't that? Loretta Bruni, if I remember correctly, and she actually defined that really well. You know, the fact is you end up rewarding yourself with the idea of, see, I was right. I always fail and I failed again. But you have that reward that says, see, I was right. And you know? it's a neurochemical reward. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, you know, it crosses every single area of our lives. Um, if you don't think you're, you deserve success, then you've just put a huge block in front of yourself. Is there an easy way or a way to identify uh, these self-sabotaging mechanisms? You know, um, I think you just pay attention to what is going on. As I said, if you see yourself repeating the same mistake, if you're always falling in, into, the same, um, into the same trap, that can be a, a way to um, identify it. Let me ask you this. If, if, you know, you face the world daily with same old, same old, you know, life sucks and then you die. Is, is that exhibiting any kind of self-destructive behavior? That's a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is part of the self-destructive behaviors, too. You know, if you think the day's going to be dreadful, then you're creating that. See, what happens is that if you think it's going to be bad, then all you're going to see are the bad things, which will reinforce that idea. Whereas if you start the day on a positive note, if you expect good, then 
all the good things out there will be observed. You'll see them, and they will reinforce that as well. So if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying negativity itself is a self-destructive pattern. Absolutely. So there was a study that we discussed just, I think it was yesterday or the day before, they had to do with placebos, an area that we're both looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was an outcome orientation in that study that I think bears relevance here. Do you want to explain that to us? I'm trying to remember that. I know it was absolutely fascinating. The placebo, uh, those that received the placebo who were optimistic, yeah, more optimistic. Yeah, more optimistic people responded more strongly to the placebo effect, which I found absolutely amazing, which is why I think there are lots of things that I will do. I mean, I do believe in homeopathy. I know there's lots of people out there that put it down, but there are homeopathic remedies that you can buy at the grocery store and I get them for colds and stuff and they work like magic for me. You You know, know, I think one of the interesting things, and I don't want to, you know, steal any of your thunder here, but one of the interesting things about that study is if you were optimistic, the real drug had more potential to eliminate pain than if you were negative. And if you were negative, well, the placebo was much less effective than it was if you were optimistic. So it isn't just about a placebo. It's about the power of our, you know, attitudes. And so is optimism um, a a countermeasure to self-destructive patterns? It is indeed. It is indeed. You know, that's a great example. You know, if you don't believe a drug is going to work, then it doesn't work as well as if you do, you know, taking out out the placebo effect aspect of it. So, yeah, that's a that's a huge self-destructive pattern because you are so determined to be sick that you won't allow the perfect drug for you to to work. All right. Well, You've encountered some pretty weird ways that self-sabotage can express itself. Can you share some of those with us? You know, that was how I got into this entire field originally. I used to work at the Leicester Royal Infirmary um, in England in the path lab there. And one day there was an anesthesiologist who was doing a special presentation to the hospital staff um, on hypnosis and hypnotherapy. And one of the stories he shared, you know, um, was to do with a a patient who had come to him. She had a pain in her arm. She'd had the pain in her arm for about 10 years, if I remember correctly. She had seen all the specialists, all the doctors. They could not find out what was wrong at all. Um, Under hypnosis, he took her back to a particularly emotional event. Didn't have anything to do with her arm. It wasn't a fall. It wasn't anything related. It was just an, a painful emotional event in her life. Um, and, you know, under hypnosis, he identified that as being the cause for her pain in her arm. Well, she came out of hypnosis, um, didn't believe it, didn't make any sense. You know, there didn't seem to be any connection. It just seemed crazy. But she went home and the following day she realized her arm had stopped hurting. It had been hurting for 10 years, but she realized it had stopped hurting. So she called the anesthesiologist back up and, you know, was incredibly happy about it. And that is really where my whole journey to into hypnosis and subliminal and inner talk and you know where all of that began because I found that story absolutely fascinating you know and then you know I've had some of my own examples you know there was a period in time where I seemed to get hay fever of some kind I had an allergy now I don't get hay fever that's not you know one of the issues I had but this um this one year um I had an allergy. I was sneezing and blowing my nose constantly and uh, it just went, it was, it was horrendous. You know, it interfered with intimacy, relationship, I mean, everything. I, cause yeah, you can't 
kiss and cuddle if you have to get up every two minutes to go blow your nose. I mean, it definitely interfered. Um, I tried the our inner talk programs. I tried a n- number of different programs, and this actually becomes kind of an interesting story because generally you can just get the most appropriate title off the shelf and it will work. But in this one example, you know, I tried our allergies program that I had used previously and had excellent results with. You know, before the year prior, I'd had a bit of an allergy, and I put it on, and within ten minutes, I was breathing better. You know, it just worked that quickly. Within two weeks, I could stop using the program. But this time, I tried the allergy program. No, that didn't work at all. Um, And so I went searching around for different issues. You know, I worked with esteem. I worked with fears. You know, it's like, well, what could it be? Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's forgiveness. You know, I tried different programs. Um, And then one day, I tried the end self-destructive patterns. You know, that's most interesting. But I played that program, and then that night, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was feeding myself poison. And when I got up in the morning, I knew, you know, just how in the morning you you can understand the most obscure dreams, they kind of fit in. And I knew right then that this was something I was doing to myself and I knew what it was as well. I was in a bit of a catch-22 situation, you know, one of those damned if you do and damned if you don't, and I didn't know how to how to get out of it. And it was that conflict right there that had me punishing myself. You know, that's what the allergy was. I was punishing myself for not finding a way out of it. And as soon as I saw the situation, it disappeared. Now, this thing had gone on for six, eight months. So it wasn't, you know, just just an interesting coincidence it totally disappeared at that point and you know when we come back we have a break i'm going to ask you more um, some for some more examples but we're speaking with ravinder taylor about her life and work you can learn more about our guests by visiting the website intertalk i-n-n-e-r-t-a-l-k dot com now we have a video for you in our chat room featuring the idea of turning your life around So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get on over there. And you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Okay, do please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Ravinder Taylor about her life and work. You can learn more about our guest by visiting her website at intertalk, I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K, one word, dot com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, as you know, because music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So we just played some of Smile, performed by the one and only Nat King Cole. Tell us, Ravinder, why is this music important to you? When did it become important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? You know, I was somewhere between the age of 7 and 11, I think, when 
This song just had a great impact on me. I was a sad little girl, really. You know, I was skinny and ugly and goofy and, you I know. I don't believe that. Well, I was told so and I looked there and I was the odd one out and wherever I was, I was the odd one out. Now, one of the things I have learned, just to pat it out, I mean, I'm not just being self-indulgent here. What, one of the things I have learned is lots of children can feel that way. They have different issues, but they all feel different and isolated so what my experiences weren't really any different to many 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 far too many children out there um, but for me um, I was this sad little girl and I knew I wasn't worth an awful lot of anything and then I came across this song and it just rang a bell within me I knew that I couldn't indulge myself in being sad I couldn't you know uh, be upset about being sad because that would make it even worse. What I had to do was smile my way through it. And I just knew that that's where the answer, the answer was. That was how I would get through all of this. And it's how I would make the, my own world better if I could just smile through it. And this song, you know, the old music is very romantic too. And those sweeping violins will just um, in, inspired me. They helped me. They helped, you know, build up that extra courage inside to smile at the world. I would not let the world see that I was this sad little girl, you know. I was going to go out there and do my absolute best with, with everything that I attempted. And I knew that if I did it enough, one day it would become true. I have to ask you this because... <clears throat> I met you at the National College. You were, uh, well, actually, Imperial College. National College was sponsoring uh, the event. And uh, you were studying hypnosis and psychotherapy. Uh -huh. And you had the most beautiful smile I've ever seen in my life. Okay. The face to remember, absolutely. I fell in love with you at that moment. Okay. But when I got back to the States, because I had a chance to visit with you, et cetera, I sent you a program. Tell us a story about that program and what you've since learned, if you will. Well, at that time in my life, um, I thought I was very realistic and practical. You know, I wasn't the prettiest girl out there. I wasn't the smartest out there, but I was okay. That isn't how I saw you, but continue. I, I thought I was okay. You know, it's okay that, you know, not everyone can be number one. You know, most people are not number one. That's just the way life is so I thought I was being very very practical so yeah you, you and I had had you know lots of long conversations during the uh, the workshop um, and after you went back you sent me a copy of the esteem because you said that you thought I needed an esteem I had an esteem issue and I thought that was a joke I didn't think I had an esteem issue I, I was doing okay I was doing well I was practical I was sensible um, I knew exactly what I could do. I wasn't afraid of stuff. At least I didn't think so. But <laughs> you sent me the esteem program and I put it on to play. It was the worst music I ever heard in my life. It was, I was irritable. I was, I only played it for a few hours, um, but I got really irritable and cranky. And then when you called that evening, you and I had our first argument, you know, um, and I was, very very vocal about how bad the music was it's like how could you put music like that that's not music <laughs> on and on and on I went and you just let me talk and we just moved on to something else and I ignored the esteem program after that I didn't play it again because it by was the just, way the lead piece on this the... particular musical track is theme from a summer place yeah so anyway continue yeah. but um Actually, no, that was two. The theme from a summer place was the freedom from stress that I had. The esteem was a Jim Oliver music. And after I got over here, I heard a different inner talk program. And it's like, wow, that music is fabulous. This program is gorgeous. And then you pointed out to me it was exactly the same music that was on the esteem program. So what I had been reacting to, you know, being so vocal about this music being dreadful had nothing to do with the, with the music at all. It was to do with the affirmations. And the affirmations were directly challenging the uh, inner beliefs I have, my own inner talk. 
Um, so on the program, it was saying I am good, but my self-talk would go come back and say, well, I'm not really good. I'm okay. I'm doing all right, but I'm not good. You know, so I was arguing everything back. So I experienced my first resistance. Now, with inner talk programs, you can always experience resistance. It, it's rare. I've been working with the programs now for 27 years. Um, and I've experienced resistance in that time about three times. Uh, it generally expresses itself with feelings of irritation, annoyance, or hating the music. And I've spoken to a few people on the phone, you know, customers with exactly that, where they have gone on and on about how bad a piece of music was. And so I shared with them, you know, my own story. Um, I did after that, go back to working with the esteem program. And my life you know, now compared to 27 years ago is night and day. Um, but one of the other things that I learned with esteem, and this, this will apply to different issues, whatever is going on, is that things come at different depths. So um, I played the esteem way back then, you know, had this huge breakthrough, was started doing a whole lot more. But then as time went on, there was something else that, that would come up. And I would r realize I had an esteem issue in a slightly different area, you know. So yeah, it just comes in different depths. So I, I have used the esteem program over the last 27 years. There can be five or six times I have gone back and played that program extensively to get me through and get me to a higher level. It's a bit like Jonathan Livingston Seagull. You know, he just went higher and higher. Well, that's precisely, that's actually a great analogy for this one, for the esteem. That's exactly, you know, my own experiences with that. You often, you know, try a program first of all because you have an immediate issue. And so it fixed that immediate issue, but then you can see something else. And sometimes that esteem, esteem underlies everything. How you feel about yourself will affect your ability in whatever areas. So, you know, you, at, at the beginning, you, you did my bio and I did. I began working for your company at the very bottom. I was packaging CDs and I really enjoyed that because I got to look at all the affirmations. But And then I started editing some of your books. And when I first started editing, I was just crossing T's and dotting I's. You know? Wait a minute. I, I don't want to interrupt you here, but I want a concrete example of what you're, you're talking about. Let's go back many years. Okay. We hired a woman who was fluent in Spanish because we were doing some Spanish translations, and she was an editor. And so I handed you material to edit, and you handed it to her because she was an editor. And, of course, as an editor... She had a degree in English, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and the editing was horrible. How long did it take me to convince you that this person didn't know what they were doing, and you did. It took you a while. You know, I have to admit, in that instance, I gave my power away. And there have been several times in my, my life I've done that. I think everyone does that. So is that when an you... example of self-destructive patterns as well? It is, because I, I didn't believe in myself. I mean, I, I read a lot. I do know the basics, you know. I was 16 the last time I took an English class, but my English skills are pretty good. You know, I, good. I have learned that though. You know, my whole idea was, well, I haven't done English since I was 16. So therefore I can't be particularly good at it. But I have proven that one over and over and over again because I do a great deal of editing. I, you know, I jump in. I do a whole lot more today than I ever did. And, uh, Hopefully one day I'll actually get my own book written too. That would be... Well, you have two in the works, cool. and they're very good, and I'm sure you will. So, okay, well, let's, let's you know, stay with us a second then. So are you saying that self-destructive patterns, uh, we may solve a pattern, um, as with the issue of self-esteem that you talked about, but but the what we solve is just a narrow... An aspect of it is and, in... And, it's the aspect that allows you to take that next step forward. 
And so then you're on the path again and you're marching ahead and whatever. And then you hit the same issue just from a different angle or a different perspective of it or some other. And so you have to solve it again in order to take the next level up. Okay, now you use the word self-esteem, and we, of course, title the program Self-Esteem, but it, self-esteem gets kind of misused out there, and today it's kind of inflated. To, you know, everybody is perfect, and you, you deserve to be perfect, and you should be perfect. I kind of think of it really as a process of self-realization. Uh, is that what you were doing as you worked with the program, realizing more and more the kinds of obstacles you had in front of you and how you could overcome them to become all possible, what, what, whatever your greatest possible uh, um, achievement might be. It is all about s- actualizing yourself. Self-actualization, uh, it's, it's like that flower coming into bloom and you want it to bloom fully, not halfway, not halfway and then droop and then die. You want to just become the best that you can be in every way possible. Um, it isn't about, you know, um, everyone can be M- M- Michael Jordan or anything like that. It's about being the best that you can in all of these different areas. Stop holding yourself back. Don't, um, yeah, don't put blocks in your way. Don't allow other people to put blocks in your way because the way society goes today, you know, those blocks come from so many different areas. They'll come from friends, from family, from teachers, from what you watch on TV, from the books that you read. You know, everyone out there is telling you you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. Your hair's not thick enough. Your hair's not black enough. You shouldn't have gray hair. You shouldn't have this. You shouldn't. It just, we're bombarded with all the things, all the ways in which we are inadequate. And if you heed those, then you will block yourself. You won't try as hard. You won't do as much. Consumption is based on the notion of deficiency. If you're not deficient, well, then you don't need these things. And so that's what they sell. You're absolutely right. Let me ask you this. Can you explain how eliminating underlying fears can lead to success? Oh, absolutely. You know, I've got one one of my favorite stories, actually, uh, that really provides the, you know, an example of this, our boys enjoy biking. And after a while, you know, we took up biking too. Um, there was a period of time when the three of you left me in the dust, always. There wasn't any way I could keep up with you. And part of me was beginning to think, well, maybe it's because your guys and, you know, our boys were ent- entering their peak in the teenage years and they're getting all strong and everything so I just put it down to I couldn't do I couldn't bike as well as the three of you could well there's an area around here where we like to bike they're just going around the block it's a big block and there's one point where you know it's downhill and the boys like to go just as fast as they can but I'm kind of cautious but then you, it goes uphill steeply And I've always wanted to achieve this uphill piece. It's not awfully long. Um, And I would begin that absolutely determined. I was determined to do it. And I would get a third of the way up and I would stop. Because I knew I couldn't reach the top. Now, I would stop before my legs hurt. I wasn't out of breath. I I just knew I couldn't do it. So my determination fizzled out within... 30 seconds I mean something really really pathetic and we tried this over and over and over again and I failed it I must have failed it 20 30 times then we had our bikes serviced and when we took it in um, uh, to the store that we went to the guy said oh you're riding on partial brakes Well, no wonder I couldn't keep up with everybody. I was riding with my brakes on. So, you know, I had it serviced. We went back out again. We came to that same hill. Um, My problem before was the brakes. So now I've got this hill and I got 30% up, fine, just as I always did. I got 30% up more, fine, you know, that's the brakes. Then that last 30% or 33%, okay, if anyone's going to be accurate. Um, But that last piece... I busted gut to do it. I knew I could do it. 
I pushed myself. You know when you're going uphill and you have to push and push, so you're going really, really slowly, but I stayed on the bike, I stayed upright, and I got to the top. Now, the story in that isn't to do with the second 33% that I achieved because, uh, you know, I wasn't riding with my brakes on. It was to do with that effort that I put at that last. So regardless of um, the brake, even if I was still riding on the brakes, if I would put in the same effort, I would have done twice as well as I would have done, you know, if I didn't have the belief that I could do it. So imagine every single area of your life. Think of academics, think of your favorite hobbies, your favorite sports. Imagine doing twice as well as you have already done. You, you know? mean putting out twice as much effort? Well you, well, you are twice as successful because you put out the effort. You don't stop. You don't block yourself. You don't tell yourself that you can't. So did you ever learn that the guy that told you you were riding on brakes did that so that you would have some psychological benefit? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> How can you change this programming? How can you change it? You know, there's um, there's a few different ways. For me, you know, I began this whole journey by looking at hypnosis, hypnosis and psychotherapy, which can be very effective. You know, that is a good way for uncovering issues, but it's, um, it can be a long is a, a process. It can be a painful process. And we have lots of issues in our lives where you don't have to go back to your childhood memories and try to uncover them and heal every single one, you know, because there are loads and loads of them. There are lots of issues where you don't need to go back at all. You can just look forward. And when you're looking forward, to me, the best thing is our Inner Talk programs. It's what makes it so easy for me to talk about Inner Talk so much because I've used them myself in so many places. Um, those self-destructive patterns um, express themselves in that talk that goes on inside you all the time. It's that talk that says, you know, I can't do this. Life sucks. I'm no good. Um, when you replace that self-talk with positive talk, whatever the particular goal happens to be, when you replace it with positive talk, then you start to remove those destructive patterns. So for example, if you are feeling depressed, you're depressed, you're blue, you're fed up, that inner talk is going to go along the lines of I'm tired, I'm fed up, my feet hurt, I'm hot, I hate my colleagues, I hate this person, I hate that person, I hate my job, I'm stupid, I can't, you know, because we do talk to ourselves constantly and on a bad day, your self-talk is going to be along those lines. Well, on the Inner Talk uh, Freedom from Depression program, which I call my Being Cheerful program, so it's not just if you're clinically depressed, it's just, you know, if right. you're feeling blue or something like that, which is exactly how I use the program, um, the affirmations on there are, you know, I'm good. Life is good. Life is fun. I enjoy life. You know, when you play that, it primes that self-talk. So it pushes those negative thoughts out and they get replaced by the positive talk. And if you think about it, if your self-talk is saying, I'm good, life is fun, this is cool, then you can't be depressed at the same time. Interesting. Why inner talk? What makes it different? Convenience. For me, it has to be the absolute convenience, you know. Um, the majority of people begin by choosing titles in the m music format because they understand that a whole lot better. But invariably, they will go to the sound of the ocean. Um, you know, I play that really quietly. You don't have to turn the volume up high to get the effect of the program. Play it so quietly in the background that it blends into background noise then you can play it extensively. You can play it 24-7. I can play them all night long while I sleep. And when I get up in the morning, I'm in a better frame of mind. And as the example I gave you earlier today, when you start the day positive, the day will unfold a whole lot more positive for you. Um, I play the program. I said, when I'm feeling down, I will play it. When I've got a job I'm working on that I don't want to do, I play st strategic planning and peak performance. Within 20 minutes, I'm at my desk doing the job that I didn't want to do. You know, some of that desk work gets kind of frustrating. Um, I use the programs all the time. It is the absolute convenience. You put it on, you play it, you 
go about your day and the change starts to happen and it happens in small ways but it builds and it builds and it builds and then one day you look back and you're being interviewed on the radio for someone who hated uh, public speaking that's not too bad that's pretty excellent <laughs> all right you've been talking about the patented and proven technology independent double blind scientific studies called Intertalk. That is correct. You can find out more about it by going to innertalk.com. That's just I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K, innertalk.com. You'll find all the research about it, and then you'll find a huge line of programs that you can get. I want to thank you, Ravinder, for your willingness to brave my questions (laughs) and share with us all. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Until next time, remember this. As Ravinder says, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.